This is going to be Nahum chapter 1. And we're going to talk about the subject of cloudy with a chance of white horses. And this is going to be about the second coming. The first thing you're going to see is revenge. In the tribulation, if you had an honest weatherman come on the TV, he would say it's cloudy with a chance of white horses and a little bit of revenge mixed in. Nahum 1.1 says, The Burden of Nineveh. The Book of the Vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. Now, historically, Nahum is prophesying of God's wrath that has come on Nineveh. And Nahum is a follow-up to Jonah. Jonah went to Nineveh and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He was preaching for Nineveh to get right with God, and they did. But Jonah didn't like this because he wanted to see the destruction of Nineveh. But what Nahum is prophesying in his little book is actually what Jonah wanted. Nahum prophesies about the destruction of Nineveh. So this is the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. And today books aren't very sought after, especially godly books. This book points point you to a future event. It, it paints a bloody picture. It even says it is a vision. Most people today are concerned only with the television. But the picture Nahum uh, paints with words is dark and bloody and much more scary than any horror movie put out by the directors and producers of The Conjuring movies or Insidious. Nahum 1-2, it says, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Jesus Christ and ten thousands of his saints are the real avengers. Jesus Christ has the capabilities of all those superheroes rode into one and then infinite times that. But this is a story of revenge. Romans twelve nineteen says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. There is no need for me to get vengeance on others when the Lord is about to have the evil man in a headlock. God is a jealous God, and imagine if your wife had about a hundred phone numbers in her cell phone, and you weren't even in her favorites, and it were all it was all men. You'd be pretty jealous. But that's what people's doing today. They got all these numbers in their cell phone. None of them is gods. It's their false gods. In Exodus thirty four fourteen, it says, "For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is jealous." is a jealous God. His name's jealous. You see, I'm jealous over my wife, and someone might say jealousy is my middle name. And the Lord's name is, is jealous. He will have a name written on his vesture and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, when he comes back at the second coming. Read about that in Revelation chapter 19. Maybe he might even have a little sticker on the right side of his chest that says, Hello, my name is Jealous. What you're going to have at the second coming of Jesus Christ is the Lord opening up a can of about 6,000 years worth of jealousy and pouring it out on you in your face. In Exodus 20, 4 through 5, it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. He doesn't want you bowing down to graven images and molten images and all this stuff. He is a jealous God. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. This is the real punisher. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is God coming down on a white horse. And the Godhead is the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So he is the Holy Ghost Rider. Much more faster than being gone in 60 seconds with 10,000s of replicas behind him. You better make sure you're on a white horse behind him because it is ride or die, as they say. That phrase, ride or die, that's where that comes from. In this war, it is ride or die. You're either riding with them or you're dead. Because the Lord 
revengeth and is furious. Nahum 2.3 says, The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. That sounds like motor vehicles. But the Lord has much more horsepower than any vehicle made by man. His supernatural horse is much more capable than any Tesla. So the Lord revengeth and is furious. He is fast and furious. Finally, an ending to the story. And there won't be a sequel because Nahum 1.8 says he will make an utter end. It's over. It is cloudy with a chance of white horses and revenge. And also, it's a raging storm. If the weatherman in the tribulation got on there and it was an honest weatherman, he would say, we've got a raging storm coming. In Nahum 1.3, it says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Jesus Christ invented weather. So it is obvious he has weather manipulation, much more power than storm from the X-Men, much more power than harp. He is slow to anger. He doesn't need anger to hulk out. He is stronger than the Hulk, even when he's in a good mood. This is why he is called omnipotent. When you, What you have is a God that gets angry, but he's slow to anger. He is so slow to anger, in fact, that lost men think they're getting away with stuff because God just ain't got mad with them yet. In Ecclesiastes 8.11, it says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. You're not getting away with anything. God is being long-suffering, but the storm is brewing. The average person trusts the weatherman more than they do a King James Bible. They trust a meteorologist more than the God that put the cloud over their head to begin with. Nam 1.3 The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. He's omnipotent. And will not at all acquit the wicked. He's not going to clear your sin unless you believe on Jesus Christ. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. So he has his way with a hurricane and the tsunami. And it says, And the clouds are the dust of his feet. My feet have been through a lot. But nowhere near as much as what Jesus Christ have went through. Your feet have been through a lot. Imagine all the walking you've done over the years. But in eternity past, Jesus Christ was around and he walked as the Ancient of Days. Way back in Genesis, he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. He stood on the holy ground as he talked to Joshua. He said, the place where on thou standest is holy ground. That's Jesus, the angel of the Lord, stood on that same ground. Jesus walked on the water. Mary washed his feet with her hair. His feet were pierced with nails. John said they were like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, referring to his feet. At the second coming, they go straight through the clouds. The Lord's feet. Because John said, Behold, he cometh with clouds. And the clouds are the dust of his feet, according to Nahum. On his way down to thresh the heathen in his anger, he comes through those clouds and the clouds are the dust of his feet. In Psalm 58, 10, it says, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. He's going to wash his feet in the blood of the wicked after he comes right down through the clouds. The clouds are the dust of his feet. Nam 1, 4 says, He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and dryeth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. What you're dealing with is the most powerful being in existence. It's not even close. Nobody can come close to God Almighty. What you don't realize is that if you're a Christian, then you are his son. And you have more than Abraham had. Abraham was called the friend of God. But you and God are even tighter than that. You have each other's number. I mean, you can go into his house without knocking. You can come boldly to the throne of grace. Nam 1.4 says... He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry. It doesn't matter if, if there is double red flags up on the beach or if Hurricane Sandy, Michael, Irma, and Katrina got together at once for a party. The Lord can rebuke 
the water, as he did for Moses, Joshua, Elijah, and Elisha. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth in Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. Bashan and Carmel is places the Jews will hide in the trib, a time of languishing. And an honest meteorologist at the end of the tribulation would say, it's cloudy with a chance of white horses and a raging storm is coming. And also with a little bit of rebukes and fury. Nahum 1.4 says he rebuketh the sea. So he can do a lot more with the sea than Aquaman can. Especially since he comes through a sea of glass to get down here. You know up there at God's throne there's a sea of glass. And there's a body, a huge body of water right there underneath it. In Habakkuk 3, 13 through 15, it says, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for the salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head. You know that the prophecy about Jesus Christ, he's going to bruise the head of the serpent. You see, the serpent's head is bruised at the second coming. It says, Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Selah. Anytime you see that word selah, that puts you in context of the second coming. It says, Thou didst strike through with his staves the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind. Notice that word, word whirlwind will show up in connection with the second coming. As a whirlwind to scatter me, their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Now watch this. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters. When the Lord and the saints leave heaven on white horses, they're coming straight through that sea of glass, through that heap of great waters that's under the third heaven. Those supernatural white horses will go straight through the great deeps up there. And Habakkuk 3.16 says, When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice of, Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. You're going to see rebukes in fury when the lion of the tribe of Judah roars like a thunderstorm and wakes you up in the middle of the night. Imagine the sounds of the second coming as he rebukes in fury. And next when he raises hell. He's going to raise hell, literally. Nahum 1.5, the mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. The world loves to raise hell, as they say. They go out at night and raise a little hell. So as a mockery to them, the Lord's going to come out one night and raise a little hell. They want to get Jesus Christ drunk so bad they can't stand it. They think the Son of God would have a beer with them. But in Psalm 78, 65 through 66, it says, Then the Lord awaked as one out of sleep, and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. And he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. He put them to a perpetual reproach. So he smites them in their hinder parts. So he opens up a can of, in Isaiah 42, 13 through 14, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy. He's going to have that that cup, that that can of jealousy, and he's going to stir it up like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I've been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. So he's coming at them like a travailing woman. When a woman is in travail, she don't care if she got makeup on. She don't care to grab your arm and rip it off. That's how the Lord's coming. That's scary. When God is so angry, he is as mad as your wife was when she was giving birth to your child. He's going to destroy and devour at once. Isaiah 42, 15 says, I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbs, and I will make the rivers islands, and I will dry up the pools. You see how all these prophets are telling you about the same events? He's coming to raise hell, literally, in flaming fire, taking vengeance. I looked up the name of the Ghost Rider's motorcycle. 
and it is called the Hell Cycle. It says it was created by Mephisto as the steed of his bounty hunter, the Spirits of Vengeance. So, it's talking about the Spirits of Vengeance, and they called it the Hell Cycle. I thought, good night, man. Can't Hollywood or the comic book writers have an original thought? The Lord is basically coming back on a hell cycle, a white horse. It's going to be a true threshing machine coming back in the spirit of vengeance. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Jesus Christ is coming back and will be what the bikers call hell on wheels. The hell's angels would look like a, a little gay boy on a tricycle compared to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nahum 1 6 says, Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Nobody can stand before him. His indignation and his anger. His fury is poured out like fire. Isaiah thirty twenty seven says, Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire, and his breath as an overflowing stream. His fury is going to be poured out like fire. It would be like God taking a big old cup, pouring fire out all over people like a bunch of ants. In Revelation 14.10, they want, you know, the people of this world want to be drunk so much. So at the, at the second coming, that's what they're going to get. In Revelation 14.10, it says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So there is a cup. And the more a person or nation sins, the fuller the cup becomes. All the country songs talking about a red solo cup and beer in their cup. Every song talks about alcohol. Every rapper raps about his alcohol he's drinking. Put more in his cup. If he could have one more drink, he says. Well, here's one more drink, and it's not in the red solo cup. It's the cup of God's wrath. And at the second coming, the Lord takes the cup and turns it over and his fury is poured out like fire. It will light you up. You're really going to get lit, as they say. All these people are talking about, let's go get lit. Okay, here you're going to get lit. And Nahum 1, seven, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. So, wow, how grateful we should be that this verse is in there. Up to this point, it's been like wrath, fury, Vengeance, jealousy, blood. But then it says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. How grateful should we be that someone who can get so angry and has so much power is actually good. I mean, we dodged an atom bomb there. I don't know if your life has had some hiccups like mine, but this is a huge break for me. God is actually good. As a lost person, I thought my luck was so bad that there would be no way that God is good. But he is good. There are two extremes. Atheists portray God as mean and angry. And that's true in the context. He is angry. But at the same time, God is also love and good and long-suffering. And many times people just focus on that. You have to focus on both characteristics of God. He's love but he can get angry. And the reason he is coming down so mean and angry is because these people are the ones who rejected his love. He's coming down in vengeance and anger on men who are bloodthirsty killers themselves. These aren't just sweet little innocent babies. These people that he's coming down on are bloodthirsty killers that would kill a baby inside of a woman's womb that was innocent. I mean, they would break its arms and legs off and sell its body parts. These are bloody men. So he makes them drunk with their own blood. I mean, he is going to raise a little hell, as they say. In Jeremiah forty-eight ten, it says, For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. You see, he's the real avenger. He could melt the suit of Iron Man. He could grab Thor's hammer and just 
toss it away. I mean, his word is like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. And it says, And the sword shall devour, and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. Made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. They're always talking about getting drunk. That's all you hear. You can't even go on vacation. All everybody did when I went on vacation that you walked by, I mean, there's like a bar everywhere with somebody drinking alcohol. They ain't got kids. It don't look like. It don't look like they have any responsibilities. It just like, looks like everywhere you go, they're drinking. And there's a bar everywhere. And then if you just sit down at a restaurant with your family, they're telling you about all the alcohol that they have. Thinking, yeah, I got two kids here. Why are you talking to me about drinking alcohol? Nahum 1.8, but with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Historically, it's the end of Nineveh. Prophetically, we're looking at the second coming. And what, a, what is a man afraid of as a child? The dark. And they will run from the Lord like a bunch of scared children when the power goes out in a storm. Darkness will pursue them. And Joel describes it as a day of darkness of, and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. He might even roar and scream, Why are you running? You love darkness rather than light because your deeds were evil. Is this not what you wanted? Darkness shall pursue his enemies. Nahum 1 9. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make another end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. So the thoughts and imaginations of man's heart is only evil continually. What do you imagine against the Lord? Jesus, knowing their thoughts, has full knowledge of who is on his side, and he's going to make another end. This is the end of the road for the workers of iniquity. This is the happy ending that the movies used to show you. Just when you thought the hero was dead, he comes through on a white horse. And I don't think Western music will be playing, but that is where they got the idea. The hero coming back at the end, they thought he was dead, but here he comes on a white horse. And to make you understanding how devastating this event would be, if the world could choose the music for an event like this, it wouldn't be Western music. It'd be something like heavy metal music. That would be more fitting. Maybe the song, Let the Bodies Hit the Floor, because that's where they're going. They're going straight to the ground. Because that's what is going to happen to the men on the receiving end of this atom bomb. All faces are going to gather blackness. Jesus Christ is like a big atom bomb just coming through and just blowing everything up in his path. Nahum 1.10, For while they be folding together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. The mighty men will get folded up like the Lord is making a paper football and then flicking it across the room. They are drunken as drunkards. That is what is on the mind of this world anyways, getting drunk, getting lit. They will certainly get both of those things. They say, we are just vibing. We're just vibing. What in the world is vibing? Every few years, they have to come up with a word for sitting back and not caring about anything but themselves. The only way they will be vibing during this future event is when the mountains quake. Then they will feel the vibration all over their bodies. The new word I've heard, uh, a kid will be listening to a song and he say, Man, this song slaps. Well, that song might slap, but not as bad as Jesus Christ on a white horse in your face. He's going to raise a little hell. Fury will be poured out like fire. The hills will melt and the earth will be burned at his presence according to, to Nahum. It says the earth is burned at his presence. And, and this is inflaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine fire all over your body and in your face, your eyes and your mouth. It will burn a lot worse than that DiGiorno pizza you tried to eat right out of the oven. Honestly, this day will be much hotter than what you cook your frozen pizza in. And Malachi 4.1 even say, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. If this day is going to burn like an oven, and Jesus Christ is called the rock in Matthew 16.18, 18, 
This means you will finally really get to smell what the rock is cooking. You see, every saying or phrase comes from the scriptures. You got the rock coming down. It's going to burn as an oven. You'll be really able to smell what the rock is cooking without Dwayne Johnson being anywhere in sight. A lake of fire will be formed on this earth when Jesus Christ raises hell. And this means when it is cloudy with a chance of white horses, the Lord is going to show you the place that's reserved for the Antichrist. And Nam 111, it says, There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Now, historically, the wicked counselor is the Assyrian Sennacherib. Prophetically, it is the Assyrian, the Antichrist. Notice that the Antichrist is called a counselor. To counterfeit Jesus Christ, who is called wonderful counselor. Revelation 19.20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. This is a place reserved for that wicked counselor, the Antichrist. Nahum 1, 12 and 13, Thus saith the Lord, Though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. Uh, historically, Sennacherib comes through, and when he passes through, they're cut down. They're afflicted. The Lord uses him to afflict those people to afflict Nineveh. He's going to use the Antichrist to afflict Israel. But then it says in verse 13, For now will I break his yoke from off thee, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. So he, the Lord's going to break the yoke of the Antichrist in the future off of, the, off of Israel. He breaks the Assyrians' bonds off the children of Israel. In Jeremiah 30, 7 through 9, it says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. The Lord has a place reserved for the Antichrist. The Lord not only prepared a place for the saints, he also prepared a place for sinners. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, but that became also a place where the sinners go too. The devil is cast into the same lake of fire that the beast and the false prophet are cast into, and it has their name on it. They did some call-ahead seating back when he rebelled, and their table is ready, and it ain't the Lord's table. When it is cloudy with a chance of white horses, they find out quickly that resting in peace turns into no rest day nor night. The world has this funny idea that everyone who dies is resting in peace. And when people claim Tupac is still alive, a lot of people come back and say, just let the man rest in peace. Or when they say, Elvis, hey, Elvis, I seen Elvis, he's still alive. They say, just let the man rest in peace. They think everyone who dies was a child of God and is in a thug's mansion in heaven, as Tupac rapped about. But as far as we know, Tupac was not a believer in Jesus Christ. He talked about God, but I mean, there's many false gods. Kenneth Copeland talks about God. Hitler talked about God. Many times, dead celebrities are remembered and their fans say R.I.P. But if these people are in hell, then they aren't having any rest day or night. Revelation 14.11 says, And the smoke of their torment is sent up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. The Lord is going to turn this resting in peace philosophy into a no rest day nor night. Because there were there will no longer be the impression that everybody is a child of God and that everybody is going to heaven. God's coming down and showing you how angry with you he is. Hell is going to be a very well-known and believed thing when Jesus Christ comes back. 
It says in verse 14, And the Lord hath, a, hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be sown out of the house of thy gods. Will I cut off the gra graven image and the molten image? I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. He's digging their grave. Look at that. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. That is God's view of unregenerate man. That is God's view of that celebrity you worship. He said they are vile. And Paul says our body is vile. But during this event, our body will have already been fashioned like unto his glorious body. And after this, there will be ruling with a rod of iron. Nahum 115 says, Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. Jesus Christ is going to be upon the mountains when he comes back. Zechariah 14.4 And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem at the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. So he is going to bring the good tidings of I'm here and I'm king, line up or lick the dust. He's going to be the ultimate ruler. Revelation 2.27 says, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Revelation 19.15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. After, after the storm's over, I mean, the honest meteorologist in the trib will say it's clouded with a chance of white horses and a raging storm and rebukes and fury and raising a little hell. There's going to be ruling with a rod of iron. It's going to be a time of peace unlike the world has ever seen. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is going to sit on the throne. Men will come and worship before him. But this has been Nahum chapter 1 about a story of revenge, about a story about cloudy with a chance of white horses.